I'm Michael Garski. I'm uh, presently with the uh, Orbiter Project Office within the Space Shuttle Program. You can't envision everything, so uh, you really need to plan. You have to have a system that is adaptable and flexible for growth or changes. For example, you might have instrumented the body flap or some aero surface that you wanted on your spacecraft vehicle. Okay, you have that data, but you didn't really get the wing very well, or you might have seen something in some other data that you didn't have specific instrumentation in that zone to get that uh, vibration environment. So you may either relocate what you had on another aero surface over to that location, or you keep what you have but you have to make sure that your system can handle and adapt to that additional instrumentation that you're looking for. The key element is to design a system and build it so that it is adaptable and flexible so that you can adjust, and it's from a flight-to-flight -flight basis. They have a pretty good idea of what they're going to look for for the very first flight. The problem is, is that you look at that first flight, they analyze that data and they say, we need more instrumentation in this zone. We see something in this zone, either A, that we don't like, or B, we just want to confirm that nothing is going on here that we don't fully understand. The, the instrumentation that you had from an ascent perspective may not be the same instrumentation that you need for on orbit or maybe even for going to the moon. So your instrumentation package and telemetry package needs to adapt to the phases of flight environment uh, as well. Because of the unknowns that you have out there, um, you will have ever-changing and increasing instrumentation. You will eventually reach a limit. If you set a specific bandwidth, you will reach a limit to where you can't add any more. And, and that's where the shuttle is now, is that we've reached our limit of capacity. We had a, uh, a body flap resonance issue that was seen that the instrumentation that we had on it was not really adequate in order to uh, find or at least detect the higher frequency resonant modes. So what we did was is we went back and modified that instrumentation in order to bring that frequency levels up into the region of where the body flap was actually resonating in. Um, that was a non-detectable or non-foreseeable event by the design engineers. It's those unforeseen events that the instrumentation system needs to uh, adapt to. So when you design and deliver your system, you need to have in your hind pocket some spare, you know, either bandwidth, spare uh, uh, channels, spare, um, you know, acquisition type uh, capability uh, in order to adapt to the changing conditions of the unknowns, and that's really what it was. It was an unknown condition that the design engineers could not foresee. They didn't see it until actually until they seen it on a monitor. It was a video monitor on the launch pad that actually detected the frequency vibration that they didn't understand. After Challenger, um, the Columbia was retrofitted, like I said, with the um, instrumentation package. Um, we uh, added an additional uh, roughly 1,500 strain gauges and an additional 700 pressure transducers in order to give us the data in order to validate the loads database in order to for our models so that we could use that says that the orbiter or the, let's say, the, the SSV, the space shuttle vehicle, can indeed fly at those ascent trajectory loads. This was a several flight thing. This was over the course of six to seven flights worth of data that they acquired in order to fold that back into the loads database in order to quote validate it. So you need to be or at least aware of the fact that the requirements from a performance perspective could change and part of it could be the fact that you may just want to change the outer mold line and that's what we did post Challenger was when we redid the SRBs, we actually changed the outer mold line by adding nothing more than foam on the outside in order to help insulate the O-rings or insulate the uh, RSRM. Now, that outer mold line change, you would some people would say that it was probably very a benign environment, but from an induced aeroacoustic parameter, when you're doing Mach 1, just a small little protuberance in the airstream actually couples into quite a bit of buffeting loads and aerodynamic loads. Now, 
just that little bit of extra foam that you added for your design change uh, could induce or at least enforce or force you to go add more instrumentation to go understand that effect because that effect wasn't your original concept when you went and did your model. You can do your best to try to understand that environment in a wind tunnel, but until you have flight data what actually records that and how the vehicle responds through that, that's going to be key. I'm Michael Garski. I'm uh, presently with the uh, Orbiter Project Office within the Space Shuttle Program. Bring the design engineers to the table with the instrumentation engineers so they can have the benefit of hearing that dialogue of what the data users would like to see. Be able to understand that so that you can, so the instrumentation team can put together a viable flight system that actually meets and even exceeds the user's requirements and the instrumentation guys would need to know that I need to carve out some some room and, and spare capability and flexibility in my system knowing that there will probably be changes in the future and, uh, and design for that capability. I'm Michael Garski. I'm uh, presently with the uh, Orbiter Project Office within the Space Shuttle Program. The Shuttle Program put together what they call Developmental Flight Instrumentation Package, and it was pallets, believe it or not, in the payload bay, a couple of pallets of avionics equipment, of data acquisition and recording hardware that, would re that recorded on or upwards of about three to 4,000 measurement parameters. And we're talking aero pressures, strain gauges, aeroacoustics for for buffeting loads, what, how is the vehicle going to react at max Q? I mean, that is a very high dynamic, uh, extreme region during your flight path. And every vehicle is going to have to go through that phase in order to get to space. You can do your best to try to understand that environment in a wind tunnel. But until you have flight data, what actually records that and how the vehicle responds through that, that's going to be key. Some people would say after four flights, we went operational. But in reality, what we did was is that we still flew some of those uh, packages uh, on board. We took some of that, offloaded some of that instrumentation package, and we downscoped it for, from about 4,000 down to about 1,000 measurements. We transferred some of our DFI measurements actually to operational instrumentation. We gained enough insight, and there was enough importance of that data believe it or not, that actually some of our original DFI data was transitioned to operational data because we felt that that measurement was critical to the insight of that critical system for on board. So some of it got transferred to operational, some of it got offloaded, uh, and some of it remained in order to keep and maintain a level of insight into the structural health of the vehicle and also the TPS.